Kill or be killed. It's the only choice you had. You didn't you didn't debate it otherwise. It was, you made up your mind it was either kill or be killed. So anything that came in front of you was regardless. In fact, the only thing I remember seeing was dead Japs uh, close to our lines. And there was nothing we could do about getting rid of them. The flies and stuff on them. They were bloated and they just laid there. I guess we were we were considered poor, but we didn't uh, didn't know it. On the farm, <coughs> excuse me. On the farm, we had uh, livestock, hogs and cattle that we butchered, and chickens, and uh, ducks and geese, and uh, so we had our own meats. The only thing that I remember my folks having to buy was uh, uh, sugar and flour as the basics. Most of the other things we had right on the farm, we always had a big big garden with a variety of vegetables of all kinds. We had a good sized strawberry patch and raspberry patch for fruits. And then we had a good size, we had a large apple orchard with about a dozen apple trees, different kinds of apples. So, but we were pretty much self-sufficient in that respect. Dad and the county agent talked me into going to the agricultural college. So I went there one year in St. Paul. And then the next year I went out to California with a cousin and with the idea of getting into defense plants. And uh, when I got our papers together, I finally got into Douglas Aircraft. But for some reason or other, my cousin was from Minneapolis and he could, he could get a job in a good department store downtown Los Angeles, but he couldn't get into the aircraft factories. So he said, heck with it, if he was going to get drafted, he might as well go back to Minneapolis. And then when, when the Japs at Pearl Harbor, I, I, they talked about uh, getting, women taking over the jobs that we had at the aircraft factory, and then we'd end up getting drafted. And I said I was allergic to drafts, so I went back home to the farm and spent the winter and the next summer until August 42 when I enlisted in the Marine Corps. We left the States the 12th of March, 43, stopped in New Caledonia and left off a battalion of Seabees. And the reason I knew that they were on the same ship, one of them was one of my schoolmates uh, that uh, was in the Seabees. And we left them off, so we spent three days in New Caledonia and then went down and landed at Melbourne, Australia on the 29th of March. And from at that, that point is when I ended up with the 1st Marine Division in the 1st Pioneer Battalion, 17th Regiment. It was the same regiment as the engineers. The main difference with the engineers, they were all dealing with heavy equipment mostly, and I had done some of that on my training in uh, Camp Elliott. And, but then uh, I ended up in the Pioneers, which was what we call the jack of all trades and master of none, mostly pick and shovel and uh, heavy lifting. New Britain was a swamp, wet, cold, and hot in the summer of the daytime and cold at night. Uh, we had 29 days that we never saw the sun. It was either cloudy, misty, or raining every day for that whole 29 days. And uh, we actually, the ground was so saturated that we were uh, had what they called a jungle hammock, which was a hammock that had mosquito netting around the outside and a, a water, waterproof can canopy over it. And we tied that up in the trees. And then uh, under that, we dug a foxhole in case of an attack. 
and you'd roll out of your hammock into that foxhole, and usually that foxhole had about a foot of water in it. So we didn't want to get into that if we didn't have to. Uh, we got called up to the front line one time, and uh, <coughs> there was uh, one squad ahead of us, and one of the guys in that squad, I knew him quite well, as his name was Moore, last name was Moore, and I only knew him as Deacon Moore. He was a quite religious guy, and a, a heck of a nice guy, that he got hit on that charge, and we got, they, they got things under control, and we got called back, so I never got up to the front lines on New Britain. I ended up with a hookworm infection at a field hospital, <coughs> excuse me, one day when that, I was sitting outside the, the field hospital on a, on a dugout, on a log, like sitting here, and the dugout was on this side of me, and it happened to be right around noon. I had my tray on on my knees with my even, or noon meal on, and a Jap bomber came out of the clouds and dr dropped a bomb. And we heard one of the guys, Guadalcanal guys, was standing, oh, maybe from here to beyond you, away from the dugout and uh, visiting with me. And when that bomber dropped a bomb, we heard the click. He drove, drove from there right into that foxhole, never missed a beat. And I spun around so fast, I took the tray out, set it on that log, and when I came out afterwards, the food was where I'd been sitting, the tray was empty. And I'd spun around and drove into that dugout. One, there was a team of dark uh, black guys came in, had, uh, landed and uh, was working on and by the beach. And uh, one of them apparently froze in place and his buddy had tried to knock him over uh, when that bomb came down and he got hit by shrapnel. So he ended up in the hospital there too. But, uh, so how close was that bomb to your position? Oh, I suppose maybe the length of my house. Wow. Uh, they were coming in to relieve us at Villamea Peninsula, and then we went back to the Cape and shipped out and went back to the island called Pavuvu, which was supposed to be a staging area, and all Pavuvu was was a uh, coconut plantation island, and where we were situated was in an old coconut plantation that uh, it was all dead, dead coconut palm fronds and all rotten coconuts. So we had to clean that all up and then try to make a company street out of it and get it set up so we could get our tents up. And uh, then we finally got to making a, digging a coral pit and crushing that and using that to make uh, road topping. And there I finally got to be driving truck, and then my old breed uh, book here, I've got a picture that shows trucks coming up out of that pit. I'm pretty sure I'm in one of those trucks, drawing, uh, dra hauling crushed coral to uh, build our company streets. And then we dumped enough of it around the area so the guys took and carried it inside the tents and built a floor in the tent for us to get us up out of the mud because of this old palm fronds and uh, rotten coconuts that they'd pushed together. Uh, they got infested with uh, rats and land crabs. And so then we'd pour uh, fuel around those piles and light them and burn the, the refuse and also burn the rats. And we'd taken the, the palm fronds and strip all the leaves off and use that to kill the rats that were coming out of that burning pile. After Pavuvu, uh, we got our shipping orders in 44. We went uh, to the island of Peleliu, which is an island that I think the Marine Corps has tried to keep undercover. Nobody hardly knows anything about it. But as far as we're concerned, the 1st Marine Division Marines, we were the only ones that went in there. 
And uh, I remember our uh, captain on board ship called us together and it, for our company commander, and he told us how many Japs were supposedly on that island and how many Marines were going ashore. He says, there isn't room for all of us on there because uh, you guys will decide who stays and who goes. The island was two and a half miles wide and five and a half miles long, so you can figure out how much room we had. So we had to get rid of the Japs before and get things secured, and they had everything tunneled and and mined and uh, uh, machine gun us uh, hidden in those coil coral tunnels all over. So that was one of the roughest ones that we had. In fact, the Guadalcanal guys said it was much worse than Guadalcanal because of the uh, concealed tunnels that the Japs had dug into there and where they had their hidden machine gun nests and that. Uh, the only way they finally got to get to most of them, they put uh, flamethrowers on tanks and then they'd run the flamethrower right into that opening of that, of that tunnel and burn them out. What didn't get burned, it sucked the oxygen out of the, out of the cave that they were in and the rest of them died back inside there because there was no oxygen for them. And we kept that up until that, uh, I think we, well, they told us we would be there for a week or 10 days. We were there for six weeks of the worst f fighting that we ever hit. Going into Pelolo, we had to cross a coral reef that was over 600 wi yards wide. <coughs> if the tide was out, you could not get a boat in there. So they, they ended up unloading at the end of the reef and everything had to be carried or floated. Luckily, our landing craft came in when the tide was in and we managed to get right up to the end of the airfield air when we landed. But uh, it was probably one of the last boats that came in and everything after that we had to uh, either carry and float. And in the old breed, I've got a picture in there that shows guys rolling 55-gallon drums across that coral reef in knee-deep water. And the other guys were carrying uh, uh, ammunition boxes, a 30 and 50 caliber ammunition, and also artillery shells and that. Anything that you couldn't float, they had to carry across that reef to get it up to shore. Yeah, when we first landed, uh, the area at the end of the airfield was covered by uh, a couple of artillery pieces, <coughs> at least one artillery piece, and machine guns. And uh, so you had to get get ashore through that the machine gun and artillery fire. And I was told that the engineers finally got a team with a welder up to where this artillery piece was in a cave up on a cliff. They got up there, and when the Japs run it out and fired a couple of rounds and then pulled it back into that cave that they had made, they had steel doors on there, and the engineers got up there with a welder and welded those steel, steel doors shut so the Japs couldn't get their artillery piece out anymore. We hit right, right at the end of the airfield, and that was a sandy sugar sand beach, and we got orders to dig in right away, and we started digging, and every three shovels full that you dug out, two of them slid back in. And we just barely had a depression in the, in the sand and got under an artillery barrage. And we had hit the deck and just laid squirming in the sand and when, the, uh, when that artillery barrage was over, I was chest deep in the sand and I didn't shovel that. I just squirmed around enough and get, go down right into the sand. The first night on Pelolo, uh, the Japs counterattacked, and uh, the ca captain of the company that put me up as a runner, and I carried the message from to the guys in the outfit, and the orders were: the first two lines are our, our infantry, American infantry, 
you let them through, and anything after that, you shoot. And we buried. We and when I got through with the running, I asked the captain. I said, "What next?" He said, "Get your rifle handy, lay out your ammunition, and uh, get down in your foxhole, and then pray that the uh, tide comes in before the Japs get they get here." So that's what we did, and luckily the uh, infantry held a line against the Japs, and then the landing craft managed to come in, and we started getting uh, supplies ashore and then driving them further back away. And we kept that up until we done it. That was basically our supplies, getting supplies ashore and getting them up to wherever they needed. Yeah, there was a, uh, a Jap, I think three or five small Japanese tanks started uh, toward the infantry lines. And we had managed to get three of our American ta Sherman tanks on board. And uh, they met the Japanese tanks and blew them up. Uh, we could see where the, the Jap tanks were in the morning. And our Shermans were set up to where they could cover that area. That was up uh, ahead of us in the infantry lines. I would say half a mile up on the airfield from where we were located. Also on Peleliu, Chesty Puller, if you ever read anything at all about the 1st Marine Division, he was uh, a real tough uh, leader of that of his or, or unit. And they had got shot up so bad on Peleliu that they had to finally take them off of the lines and we ended up taking their positions for 10 days up there. <clears throat> and uh, and then when we were moving into the positions that they had been in, one one of our guys asked the guy in the position he was taking, uh, they had coral piled up in front of them where they were sitting, and then they had it piled up on the side and just opening out in the forward uh, toward where the Japs were. And then you had, they had an opening that maybe about that big wide. And one of the guys asked one of the guys that they were relieving, uh, if you hung an arm or leg out of that opening, what would happen? He said, you hang your leg, arm or leg out there all day and they won't touch you. He said, don't get your head in front of that opening. You're gone. They got snipers like zeroed in on that. So, anyhow, we stayed there and held that position until the army came in and relieved us on on Pelado. We lucked out. There were five of us in the same uh, uh, parapet, I suppose you'd call it, that we had built up. And uh, out of the five of us, we never got hit. Either one of us. But I lost a young guy that came into Otford. He had been in my tent on Pahuvu. And uh, I doubt that he was uh, much over 17. And he had, we had got to be pretty good friends. And anyhow, he had come over from his dugout to mine and was talking about uh, trying to give me his mother and girlfriends address because he thought maybe I'd get a chance to come home after Pelolo and he wanted to give me those and then he got orders to get back to his dugout for uh, chow time and he got back there and just barely got back and he got hit by a sniper and we were up on a ledge higher than at least as high as this room and then another ledge above that and uh, they helped carry him down off of that ledge, and we never saw him again. He didn't survive because he got hit through the jugular vein. And there was no way you could stop that. Blading through there, and it'd be right into his mouth. And when we, when he went down, we got him down. We opened fire on the area where we figured that that sniper had been, and we cut the grass off of every rock and or the coral ridge that we could see and uh, we didn't see the sniper anymore. Uh, so he got what he deserved. 
We hope, hope that somebody got him. We, we don't know who. But his last name was Temple, and he was somehow related to Shirley Temple, that he was from California. But uh, I'm thinking Jimmy, but I'm not positive. And I never got to find out what part of California. I think he was from Los Angeles area, but I don't have any idea beyond that. Is there, is there anything you can tell us about his personality? What kind of person was he? He was uh, a young young man, I say, and he's still in his teens, by maybe 17. I doubt if he was 18 yet. And uh, I would say he's somewhat religious, not overly. And then we got, we did get an issue of beer, and those of us drank, usually I always bought uh, from those that didn't drink. And uh, he said he didn't drink beer, had never drunk beer, so I was going to buy his uh, ration. And uh, well, he said he'd try one. So he was writing that night when he got that issue of beer, he was writing a letter to his mother or his girlfriend or both. And... Uh, he drank one bottle of beer, and then he shut down and went to bed. And the next morning, he started reading the letters that he had been writing, and he tore them up. <laughs> and he showed me the rest of his beer. He said he would never drink again. <laughs> so, but uh, like I say, he was—I doubt if he was 18 yet. Of course, you got in the military. You got your ration of beer, regardless, of whatever. So but that was that was the second one that I lost to uh, uh, the personnel from the unit that I was with. <coughs> and uh, anyhow, we stayed up on that line until uh, the army came in and relieved us. The only thing I remember seeing was dead Japs uh, close to our lines, and there was nothing we could do about getting rid of them. The flies and stuff on them. They were bloated and they just laid there. Yeah, I remember it, a couple of close calls on uh, on Pelolo. One of them was a piece of shrapnel came through the ponchos that we had overhead for our uh, rain and sun shields, landed about an inch away from my uh, forehead, and. Uh, we tried to dig it with a bayonet, and it, you couldn't get it. It was down in the coral, buried in. And another time, uh, I went from the one ledge that we were on down to the next ledge to get a can of five-gallon can of water. And just as I got hold of the can of water, the uh, clatter up above, and uh, one of the guys called down. And he says, "Well, John, were you ever lucky?" And I said, "What's now?" Uh, he said, well, we got a piece of red hot shrapnel about four inches wide, about six inches long, and about three quarter inch thick, uh, right where your right leg usually sits when you're sitting up here. And uh, it would have cut my leg off right at the, above the knee, but I wasn't up there. I swore because I wasn't, because that would have been my ticket out at the time, but I never got hit otherwise, so I guess there was something, somebody watching over me to keep things going. But those were the two basic ones that I remember. The, the island in Pelola was like this, ridges of coral. And uh, you'd be sitting here, and the coral, coral wall here, and that went down in, and the next one might be higher or lower. And uh, so you didn't know what was in between those ridges. I had one <coughs> one one night that uh, I was uh, setting guard watch. I think it was about two to four o'clock, and I heard something rattling out in front of us. And uh, I thought it was a Jap sniper trying to sneak in or uh, infiltrator. And anyhow, I take a grenade and I'd throw it way out 
uh, into the ahead of us. They'd go off and they'd be quiet for a little while. Pretty soon you'd hear that cluttering again. And I dropped bayonets, uh, uh, hand grenades uh, as close as I dared. And it'd be quiet for a while and pretty soon it'd start in again. I finally got, uh, I could hear it was fairly close and I sat down and was started skylighting and I don't think it was from here to you. I see a rounded cape coming up over a rock. I thought it looked like the top of a Japanese helmet. So I was hearing my rifle in it and I figured when I see the edge of the helmet, then I'm gonna fire. And all of a sudden this thing starts waving some arms. It was a land crab about uh, almost uh, eight, 10 inches in diameter. <laughs> Had crawled up on the rock there. <laughs> well, it could have been a Japanese land crab. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was almost tempted to fire, but we were under strict orders not to fire and ex uh, except on the absolute positive identification. And you remember <clears throat> another night about the same watch there was fly, shrapnel flying off of the trees and brush, whatever it was, off the rocks. And uh, I think I was almost on the verge of panic at the time. And for some reason I remembered my mother singing a song when she got under stress, God will take care of you. And that song came to my mind, and it was just like somebody put up a, a glass shield in front of me, and nothing, everything was going around me, but nothing touched me. Till daylight, and we had got our ponchos that we had for rain shelters were all full of holes, but we, nobody got hit. We had a lot of interesting experiences on Pelolo that way. That's incredible. Yeah. Then we left there and went back to Pooh and uh, back into the same area that we had built up March of 45 when we went into uh, Okinawa. And one of my buddies and I we were on board ship and uh, we didn't go ashore until the third day. And the ship went out to sea every night and a buddy of mine from California, he wanted to get ashore. And I went and asked him what, why he wanted to get ashore. I said, you got three square meals and a good dry bunk to sleep on on board ship, and you want to get on that darn mud hole and on the island. Well, he said, it was kamikaze. And I said, well, it's, the captain of the ship isn't any better than the rest of us. If the ship goes down, we go with it. He didn't want to do that. We got on shore the first or the third day, and it was pretty just much of a walk-in. But then after that, the infantry run into a, a real uh, saw blade, and, and they hit, hit a lot of heavy power. And on Okinawa, and that got finally secured. There I was a truck driver on Okinawa, and uh, just haul supplies up to the lines as close as possible, and then get back and get another load. And I was driving in mud that was uh, axle deep, and, uh, with all the wheels going and everything running. One day I trained, three, I burned out three tires out of, out of six on the truck. And I had two dead ones up in the rack and one on the wheel when I got into the motor pool. We had to change them, they were cut up by shrapnel in the mud. And, uh, but I drove truck basically on Okinawa all the while I was there. Well, we carried mostly uh, uh, rifle ammunition, uh, machine gun ammunition, 30 and 50 caliber machine gun and rifle ammunition. And uh, we had uh, uh, mortar, round, mortar rounds and uh, artillery ammunition that we carried up to where those units were so that uh, we could take it up to close to the line as possible and get unloaded and then get back and get another load. And just followed them up that way. But we were in that mud. It, it'd come in every, just about every time with a shredded tire or, more, or two because you had all, all six wheels pulling. There was single tires on the front and 
duels on all four four wheels in the back. That that was just churning mud. It was a what close to what they call the Shuri Castle area of uh, Okinawa. Off the beach, <coughs> and uh, it was when the entrance was really hitting rough going, and a, a family of uh, Okinawans came up out of the ocean, and there was a woman that had a little baby in her arms, and the baby had died, and they had what uh, we found out they had gone down a cliff, somehow got down to the ocean, and followed the, the uh, beach to where they came up uh, off the airfield. And uh, the tide had come in while they were making this maneuver, and the water got too deep, she couldn't keep the baby above the water. And the baby had drowned while they were making that transition. So when they came ashore and we had a uh, take them into a retention camp where they kept uh, prisoners and uh, the Okinawa, Okinawa people that were kept behind the lines so they wouldn't, wouldn't run into interference with them. But I got by, like I say, I got easy because I was driving truck all the while. Then when Okinawa got secured, the uh, we were getting ready, getting training and regrouping new new personnel added to get ready to go to Japan because we were planning on landing, invading Japan. And we were told that uh, troops from Europe, short timers, were being shipped either through the canal or around the Horn and up to the islands where we were and the guys that had seen a lot of combat in uh, Europe would be transshipped to the East Coast and then they'd get a 30-day leave to go home and then be picked up by ships on the West Coast to bring us over to where we were too. And then, of course, when they dropped the atomic bombs, the first one, the Japs didn't believe that that was possible. and. Uh, but when they got the second one, then they finally decided, uh, surrendered. And on that, that night of surrender, they had one of the biggest celebrations that we ever had. I think I got about as close to drunk as I could get. <laughs> Our home church was in Comfrey. It was eight miles away. And we went every Sunday. And uh, as, you know, as kids, we, we got involved in Christmas programs and stuff like that. Sunday was Sunday church was at our main main morning Sunday morning after chores field uh, milking cows and uh, feeding livestock then get ready for church and get into town in time. And I know it's awesome. I you know we're doing this interview today on a Sunday and you went to church earlier today. Yeah. And so I think that's great. You know God's important and and that more people need Him in their lives. Yeah. Yeah, I still go every Sunday, and when I'm capable, I sing at the choir yet. I never sing low, I sing solo. <laughs> well, I would say for young people, especially kids in school, definitely try to keep out of trouble, keep your nose clean, what I call it. Don't get into involved in police records because if you ever decide to get into any kind of government employee, whether it be law enforcement or anything else, you're going to have to prove that you've got a clean record or you don't get in. Uh, most occupations don't want anyone that's a troublemaker. So keep yourself as clean as possible and do the best you can to try to build up a good reputation and then work from there in any f form of work that you t go into. Do the best you can 
and keep yourself in good order, regardless of what you're at. I can't think of any better information than that. That's great. Well, I never consider myself a hero. I'm just a survivor. The good Lord keeps me going one day at a time, and I keep on doing what I think is right. I, I don't know any more than that. Hi, everyone. The, this is Rishi Sharma. I'm the one who interviews all the World War II veterans. Today, I'm privileged to be with uh, World War II hero Jack Moran. And I just want to ask you, whoever's watching, please consider supporting my efforts to document the World War II veterans. It costs a lot of money to travel and meet the veterans and, and videotape them and get the interviews edited. And any donations go towards getting these heroes preserved forever. I'm a combat veteran of World War II, who fought in, in Europe with George Patton. Uh, it'd be great if you people Many of you would help support Richie's work. He's done a great job for several years. He's one of the few people really keeping alive the memory of all the people who died with me, protecting everybody's rights and protecting our, our democracy. Uh, if anybody, if you could help, that would be just most appreciated. And uh, he'll continue to do this great work, and and uh, you'll be you'll, you'll be helping, impressing a, gr a great number of people and getting them to know about the sacrifices that were made to, to, to keep this country safe. So please, please, please help. Absolutely. Thank you for saying mm -hmm. that, sir. People like Jack Moran deserve to live forever. And with your help, he can. These stories will go on for eternity, educating future generations about the true sacrifices made by a bunch of young kids who are willing to put their lives on the line so we wouldn't have to. Amen. And God bless the World War II veterans.